Hello and welcome to Our American States, a podcast from the National Conference of State Legislatures. I'm your host, Ed Smith. As the federal government has essentially become hamstrung in being able to do much of anything, so much of the policy initiative has shifted to state governments. And I think that's one of the, the great and so far, I think, mostly undiscovered truths of what's happened in the last decade. That was Don Kettle, professor emeritus and the former dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland College Park and an expert on federalism. He's the author of more than two dozen books and also writes a monthly column for governing. Don sat down with me to discuss the current state of power sharing between the state and federal governments and why understanding that dynamic is essential to understanding the state of governance in the U.S. Don covered a lot of territory in this conversation, including why the states increasingly are the center of domestic policymaking. He also talked about the power relationship between legislatures and governors and how he expects the balance of federalism to shift in the coming decades. Here's our discussion. Don, welcome to the podcast. It is great to be with you today. Well, Don, to start, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your research and writing over the years. I know you've published more than uh, two dozen books, and I wonder if you could share with readers some of the highlights. Uh, This is that classic question asking you to summarize decades of experience in uh, five minutes, but uh, let's give it a try. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the question, too, because it gives me an opportunity to stop and think about the, where all of this started and where I ended up now. And uh, actually, my, my earliest work focused on the, the basic question about how it is that, that government worked. As a, as a kid, I loved to, to, to tinker with things and to, to, to build things back even the days before there were Legos. And so I've always been curious about how things work. And that question led me to the question of government and how government worked and the question of how government worked on the ground led me to federalism. I, my earliest work was on the Community Development Block Grant Program way back in the 70s. And the question about how power was allocated and how government leadership worked. And so I've been following that question for a long time and following the, the thread of federalism that is, I think, one of the great constants that really connects the, the, the big questions about what kind of big decisions we make in domestic policy and how we carry things out. And so I followed that not only through the block land programs, but then poking around issues like Medicaid, and then more recently looking at all the issues that surrounded COVID. Big question there about how power ought to be distributed, what kind of role the different levels of government ought to have, and uh, among other things, the the great discovery that most people, in fact, have forgotten that that counties really matter because most of the on the ground operations dealing with COVID dealing with vaccination programs and other things were centered in the public health departments of, of state governments, which are the the agents operating in counties. And so those, it's a big thread that has been carried through my work. I mean, how, how should we make policy? How does it work? How does it work better? And how does accountability work? And so that all is a, is a basic question of federalism and has been for me for literally for decades here. Well, you're certainly right. COVID was an awfully uh, good uh, display for people of how government works. And I, I'm not sure everybody grasped the federalism aspect in it, but it, it certainly did demonstrate that. So, so let's home in on federalism for just a minute. This is, of course, as you indicate, the foundational structure of our nation, but it's not a static thing. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit how federalism has changed in practice over the last 50 years. Uh, it's a great question. And I think that there have been a couple of truly important transformative moments in federalism over the last 50 years. Uh, maybe to go back just slightly further, of course, to the great society. And in terms of federalism, we tend to think about the war on poverty, which is super important. But the, the real sleeper program that has become far more important over the years has been me- the creation of Medicaid back in 1965. There is the, the basic question about what kind of role the government as a whole ought to have in dealing with health care for people who are, who are not wealthy and don't have insurance. Programs for the poor through Medicaid have been one of the, the truly important issues of federalism in, in the last 50 years and now have come to dominate state budgets. That's the, the largest single element in budgets of states across the country, which is something back in 1965 that I don't think anybody really imagined was likely to happen. 
We had that time in the 1970s where where Nixon tried to push more decisions back to local governments through block grants, but that in, in many ways just didn't work very well. Didn't work very well because it it foundered on the basic questions of who was going to control the money, and and the feds, as it turned out, didn't really like the idea of of giving money away without being able to control the way in which it was used. Uh, then there was the, the the great deal that the states could have taken and didn't back in the Reagan administration. Reagan actually offered uh, a swap of programs. He said, he "said I'll take Medicaid and health care if you guys in the states take welfare." And the governor said, oh, no, no, we're not going to fall for that one because we know that that welfare is the, the big monster that we can't control. And so they passed up on what would have been the salvation of their budgets for all time. But it turns out that they passed on that deal and in the end uh, ended up with both the responsibilities for welfare. And then in addition to that, had even greater responsibilities for Medicaid. I've been in higher education for a long time and I've talked to people over the years about how that deal in many ways was responsible for transforming state support for higher ed, because the more money that was allocated to Medicaid, the less money there was for higher ed. And much of the financial problems that state governments have been struggling with when it comes to higher ed really have their roots in the the basic decision about Medicaid. Then we have welfare reform during the uh, during the Carter, I'm sorry, during the Clinton administration, and in the Clinton administration, there was an effort to try to uh, have a grand bargain between the Republicans and Democrats, and and more state responsibility in dealing with the question about how to to ensure that uh, we have work requirements and other things that came out of the the great work that was done in Wisconsin and and in Michigan that really transformed the system. A kind of sleeper time, I think, for federalism. For a large part during the uh, during the Bush administration, where we were focusing much more on national issues and homeland security, and where homeland security became this thing that state and local governments didn't really need that they know that they needed to worry about, but in the process we ended up with probably the one of the one of the most effective uh, homeland security agencies in the entire country, and the guise of the of the New York City Police Department. And the fact that now all state governments have to worry about homeland security. But there was the blast that came along the way with Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And what we had there was this realization that the things that we needed to do uh, to deal with, uh, with terrorists from abroad were in many ways the same kind of capacities we needed to deal with hurricanes. So there's this great realization about the, the need for greater c- cooperation between local levels of government, between local governments in the states, and between that entire system and the federal government when it came to issues that, that FEMA dealt with and, and hurricanes and other kinds of disasters. And then ultimately, then we've come to uh, these days, the, the battles over immigration, which have surprising federalism undercurrents to them. And then uh, that in the backdrop of the, the battle over covid the battle of the COVID in terms of what it is that we think ought to be done to try to uh, to deal with questions, big questions of public health. And what all these issues have in common is that the question of, of the financial responsibilities of the federal and the state and local governments about the, the way that power gets distributed among levels of government, but then ultimately the, the fact that we've discovered that no one level of government can, can really control anything anymore. So how we're going to devise the, the systems of collaboration and cooperation that we need to ensure that the government that citizens want is a government that they get. So, yeah, I found your uh, column about Richard Nixon very interesting. I think that was kind of the maybe a little before that was when I first started paying attention to politics and government. And Nixon, of course, in, in memory is much maligned, but there were some very interesting things that he did uh, in the environmental realm and then in the area of federalism. So even if that effort to devolve more power back to the states didn't really work out for Nixon, what you're describing is really sort of a new relationship between the federal and state governments, one that would have been very difficult to anticipate, but one that we now find ourselves in and maybe one that begins to affect policy. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, it's affecting policy. In, in different ways, two different points that I think we need to make here. One is that we have this this increasing interconnection on everything to the point that it's very difficult for anybody 
to try to decide what it is a policy ought to be, but at the same time, a rising role for the states because as the federal government has essentially become hamstrung in being able to do much of anything, so much of the policy initiative has shifted to state governments. And I think that's one of the, the great and so far, I think, mostly undiscovered truths of what's happened in the last decade. But the other thing is that as, as the states have become more of the center of policy, we also see that there are great differences developing between the states on how that policy ought to work. It's happened in environmental policy with, with California setting uh, very aggressive standards that essentially are becoming uh, the, the ways in which national policy is being shaped. But at the same time, we have tremendous pushback from, from other governments, uh, other state governments, uh, against not only the, the Californiaization of domestic policy, but, but also the, the, the big battles over issues increasingly of social policy, like abortion. And here there's a and that second piece, the, the increasing differences among the states, is a profound paradox that's developing as well, with the, the battle over abortion having been fought for a generation, and f- finally having Roe v. Wade and the minds of the conservatives being unwound, having the Supreme Court deciding that there's no national right to privacy inherent in abortion questions, pushing the decisions back to the states. The states beginning then to try to uh, shape their own policies, but then having those policies uh, now being evolving to the point where some states are saying that what they're doing at the state level ought to become national policy. The argument about devolving power to the states now evolving into a question where uh, the argument is that some states are saying what they're doing ought to become national policy. So it's just turning the whole argument on its head and turning the argument on its head obviously for, for matters of politics, which are, are always the case here, but, but then more fundamentally, the, the big question about how the balance of power ought to go. And, and I think what's happening is that instead of what was a kind of top-down strategy of federalism back in the Johnson administration, for example, with the war on poverty, where the federal government is clearly in the driver's seat, we're shifting now, I think, very clearly to a position where the state governments are in a driver's seat, and the state governments are defining national policy. And that's been evolving, I think, over the last decade. It's a kind of sleeper trend that's going on, but one that's terribly important, I think, that we pay very careful attention to. And I think that because federalism often doesn't get much attention, and because the the separate and independent role of the states as entities often don't get much attention either, uh, this really is a sleeper issue in domestic policy. I think demands much more careful attention here. Now, I wonder, abortion is, a, of course, an excellent example, a very high profile one that's also been affected by the ability of citizens to uh, run initiatives and that sort of thing. So bringing in another another level of governmental uh, assertion there, I guess, on the, on the part of citizens in states where they can put that on the ballot. You mentioned environmental law and particularly uh, the regulation of automobile emissions and that sort of thing in California. Are there other policy issues that you think are shifting to states uh, and away from the federal government? I think that we have issues on homelessness that I think have become uh, tremendously important in, in many communities, but where we have the, the question about what to do about what's becoming an increasingly important issue for many, many, many communities. And uh, the federal government has some policies as providing some money, but where the the big issues, I think, the big strategies are being developed in the states and are being developed in local governments and creating often, in many cases, tensions between the state governments and local governments, where, uh, where California is providing, for example, a lot of money to local governments, but putting requirements on the way in which that money is being spent in ways that local governments are bristling about. Uh, in Texas, here where I'm sitting, the there are local communities that are, in some cases, trying very hard with some innovative strategies to try to reduce homelessness. Houston, for example, has reduced homelessness by like 64% in the last decade, but constantly complaining about the restraints that the state government puts on them and being able to make that happen. So we see, see that issue developing. I think we see issues that have to do with, uh, with with transportation policy, which I think increasingly have become state-centered, but which have to do with the balance of power between those who want to try to build more highways and those engaged in 
more rapid transit. So we have, have that as a, as a big issue. We see continuing competition among the states on economic development questions, both in the, 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 the famous battle about whether or not the, the California or the Texas strategy will win in the long run, but also the competition among the states to provide tax breaks for uh, and the competition for, for jobs and to try to develop the economy. If you look across the board, uh, you can see that the states are becoming the, the place where these issues are being fought out. And instead of what's happening at the federal government, where people are just fighting, uh, the issues are being fought out and resolved, in many cases in different ways in state governments, but, but being, being resolved at the state level. So it, it does sound like you're describing a nation where the center of domestic policy is becoming more and more the states, and maybe that's the Jeffersonian ideal of uh, the federal government ought to be there to guard the borders and deliver the mail. Um, is that where we are? Uh, and, uh, the, the guarding the borders piece is one worth coming back to because, uh, to a surprising degree, the states are shaping that policy as well. But uh, we, we are seeing, I think, a, a rebalancing. And we are seeing the federal government in a position of, of writing lots of checks. But uh, in terms of, of domestic policy, we see, uh, I think, these, these battles centering in the states and, and maybe book bans and about what it is that ought to be taught and how it ought to be taught. And we see, the, as I mentioned, issues of immigration. The fascinating question now being fought out, not only in, in state governments, but also in the courts about where the, the power ought to rest in the question about what it is that uh, and who it is who ought to be setting that policy. Uh, we literally have, have a battle at the very bank of the Rio Grande in Texas about who ought to be able to string barbed wire and razor wire and whether or not uh, the wire can be cut. Uh, the state of Texas is battling now with the, uh, with the federal government over whether or not the federal government was uh, was violating its powers by cutting razor wire that had been stretched across by the, by the state government of Texas. We see battles back and forth on the the issues of, of of busing people from the border to other communities, creating inter intergovernmental crises that otherwise might not have existed. We see even uh, we we see the, the state of Texas string buoys across the 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 border at the at the river and raising questions about international affairs, where the, where the state of Texas is, is reshaping the kind of policy that, uh, that the United States and Mexico is having to deal with. And we even see some interesting intergovernmental battles where there are uh, quiet disputes along the border between Texas and New Mexico on issues of, of immigration and whether or not the, the somewhat more, more flexible policy in New Mexico ought to be visited upon the people of the state of Texas. So we, we see that happening as well. And we see some of those border disputes spilling over as well on issues of abortion. It turns out that, that the busiest abortion clinic in New Mexico is an Uber ride away from El Paso. And so we have transportation strategies for, for abortion advocates uh, trying to get people to El Paso where they can just take an Uber on a short ride across the, the border into New Mexico to receive abortions. And then efforts in some communities to fight back against that, to, to, to ban the, uh, the transit of people seeking abortions on their roads across their borders as well. So we see uh, the, the state governments taking a far stronger role and, and disputes between the states ending up being the, the locus where so many of the important value judgments are being fought out. Yeah, one of those interesting uh, areas of migration have been all the uh, people who have been bused to other cities. I'm here in Denver. It's become quite the crisis here. I guess that's a somewhat overused word, but certainly in New York and Chicago, uh, local officials have beseeched the federal government to help, help them with this. So it is an interesting way that it's spilled out. and It's not simply a Republican and Democrat uh, argument so much as it is uh, one often with mayors, vis-a-vis -vis governors and that sort of thing. With states as bigger players, that doesn't necessarily mean legislatures, our principal audience, because during the pandemic, we saw a lot of authority in the executive. Uh, it was a, an emergency. The governors had to make the decisions. And uh, there was often quite a bit of 
argument between legislatures and governors over uh, over that power. And in, is this a larger shift of power from legislatures or governors or executive in general? Do you think? Yeah, I think that the uh, if this big sleeper issue is has been the the increasing role of the states in shaping domestic policy, and if the the way in which that's shaking out has created important disputes among the states about how that ought to work. The the even more subtle issue that sh- that's taking place is where within the states is that power being centered. And I think that what we're seeing is a reflection in real time at the state level about some of the bigger things that we hear rhetorically at the national level. There's been this question about the, the unitary executive and about how much power the, the executive ought to have. And there's this the battle taking shape, of course, as we enter the, the national election about how much power the president ought to have. That question, in many ways, has been resolved because Congress has proven to be uh, incapable of doing almost anything on time and doing almost anything, period. The, the way in which that's really shaking itself out more fundamentally is as the states have become more important in shaping domestic policy, there's been the question of where within the states that power is resting. And I think what we're seeing is legislatures, to be sure, having an important role and, and taking some some policy actions. But it's it's the executive branch, especially the governors, who are in the ascendancy. I think we see in the, the ascendancy of executive power in the states. You can look at it, whether it's uh, it's in California with Governor Newsom and the kind of efforts that he's taking on everything from from homelessness to even even daring to debate Ron DeSantis. And then we have Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott, on the other hand, uh, taking an exceptionally strong role, not only personally in terms of the way in which they're shaking power out, but but also in the way the executive branches that they head are are reshaping policy, whether it's uh, in, in Florida, the effort to try to, to, to rein in higher education and to reshape the way in which that's working. We see it happening in immigration in Texas. We see it, though, on the on the, on the grassroots having to deal with a, a big battle over whether some states are simply not taking advantage of money the federal government's providing for everything from, from school lunches during the summer to uh, the, the, the broader issues about social policy that, uh, that where the federal government's making money available and that some states are refusing to accept it. So it has to do with executive decisions that are shaping the way in which domestic policy in turn is being shaped. And the legislatures have an important role, but the the kind of traditional role that has been taking place having to deal with, with managing the budget and creating new programs has become relatively less important compared to the, the kinds of decisions that governors are making day after day after day and the way in which their executive branches, their, their departments, are, are transforming policy in so many different ways. Well, I think it's always difficult to look into a crystal ball, and I'm, I'm not sure if we'd looked into a crystal ball in the uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson administration, we would have accurately predicted where we are today. But nonetheless, I'm going to ask you to do just that. And as we wrap up, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where you see the balance of federalism shifting in the next next few decades. Yeah, I, that is... That's a great question, and uh, uh, the good thing is people probably will never remember what I say. So I'm hoping to be able to hide behind some anonymity in that. But but I think uh, a couple points. One is that uh, this is, I think, one of the truly big questions that we're facing. A question in particular about where the balance of power in American government is going to rest. I think as we engage in this big dispute and battle over the future of democracy in the country that is is taking shape for the 2024 presidential election, we're not paying any attention at all to the question about how it is the power is flowing to the states and how states are going to use it. And that may very well have, in the policy world, far more impact than what what people are recognizing. It's the question about how the the balance of power then between the states and local governments, where most people do do their business and get their services, how that's going to shape. And we see lots of conflicts shaping up between increasingly urbanized areas in particular and and relatively conservative governors on the other hand, which I think are going to 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 be some of the, the some of the great things that actually 
are going to shape the way in which domestic policy happens. I think that we're going to see a shift increasingly of power from legislatures to governors because of the importance of trying to resolve some of these questions. I think we're going to see greater divisions between the states and how this shakes out so that the uh, the, the, the Ron DeSantis's and the Greg Abbott's of the world on the one side and and the, and the, and the Governor Newsom's on the other, I think, are, are going to create what in many ways is going to be the fundamental area of, of dispute and contention and shaping policies. And I think create increasing inequalities among the states and how they approach these issues. I think that as we look to the big questions about trust in government, ultimately, I think that what we what we're doing is going down a road where it's going to be increasingly hard for the federal government to gain trust from from anybody because of these disputes, which I which I fear are only going to get worse. But where the the traditional focus of trust in American government at the state and local level is going to be defined by the way in which service delivery happens and the way in which governments are are seen as reflecting the views of their citizens, and and that big question having to deal with uh, with trust, I think, is going to be resolved then. I've, I've been writing for a while about about the issue of trust. And I think we can think of, about trust as a kind of wholesale issue, where at the national level, it's it's big and it's the thing that everybody thinks about. And can we trust Congress, trust the president? But uh, can we trust government to do the right thing? It's, it's almost impossible to move that needle. But on the other hand, what we see is that at the retail level, where citizens interact with government, which means interacting primarily in their day-to-day lives with state and local governments, that the trust increasingly depends on how well that interaction works. The big question about can we build trust in government, I think is going to be a question that will be resolved or not, to the degree to which it's possible to attack it at the state and local level, which, as we think about the future of democracy, is pretty important, I think, and which I think is the real sleeper issue ultimately for the next few decades about how we're going to be able to resolve the, the kind of interaction between citizens and their expectations about what government ought to do. And on the other hand, the, the big question about the way in which state and local governments can manage to deliver services more effectively in ways that, that build that trust. Well, I think that is a great place to leave it, Don. And I thank you very much. I think everyone will find this uh, a, a very illuminating conversation. Thank you and take care. Well, thanks so much. It's been great fun talking about this. And it's it's kind of fun to, to go about exploring the, the kinds of things that, that I think get nowhere near the attention that they need, but which are going to be shaping the way in which things really happen in this country. So thanks so much for the chance for this conversation. I've been talking with Don Kettle, an expert on federalism, about the balance of power between the state and federal governments. Thanks for listening. You can check out all the podcasts from the National Conference of State Legislatures by searching for NCSL Podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast, Our American States, dives into some of the most challenging public policy issues facing legislators. On Across the Aisle, host Kelly Griffin tells stories of bipartisanship. Also, check out our special series, Building Democracy, on the history of legislatures.